In this video, I give some alternatives to the five room dungeon method. Let's start at the beginning. The original Dungeons and Dragons. This is the Wilderness Adventure, Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. On page four, it says, "In the beginning, a dungeon. In beginning a dungeon, it is advisable to construct at least three levels at once, noting where stairs, trap doors, and chimneys and slanting passages come out on lower le levels, as well as the mouths of chute and teleportation terminals. In doing the lowest levels, it is uh, such. Let's see, of such." A set, it is also necessary to leave space for the various methods of egress to still lower levels. A good dungeon will have no less than a dozen levels down with offshoot levels in addition and new levels under construction so that players will never grow tired of it. Let's repeat that phrase again. A good dungeon will have no less then a dozen levels down with offshoot levels in addition and new levels under construction so that the players will never grow tired of it. That was written by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. That's page four of the volume three of the original D&D &D books. So that first off, that's what they, they wrote. That's probably written by Gygax simply because he later on talks about Gygax's uh, Gygax, Cax, uh, Greyhawk Castle. So then in 1997, Richard Gilbert wrote an article called Designing a Dungeon in and was published in the Dragon Number 10. When designing a dungeon, before you begin madly scattering shoots, monsters, and secret doors, take a moment to figure out what it's all for. If you're postulating a world with any sort of realism at all, you must appreciate that a dungeon doesn't come into being for the hell of it. To the people of your world, digging a dungeon out of solid rock is a tremendous task, not one to be undertaken lightly. You as the designer must think like the builders when you design a dungeon and allow for all the necessary functions of the dungeon. Don't be concerned with the players entering your organized dungeon with too few difficulties in traversing it any D&D player quickly develops the suspicious mind and almost paranoic, uh, parano I can't say that word, paranoic attitude necessary for survival. His fears coupled with the, his general lack of information about your dungeon will make your dungeon far more mysterious than you would ever believe. Now this is an interest, this is an interesting discussion about the design and planning of a dungeon. And uh, I had to throw in a little bit of poetry by Kipling. It's called The Palace. And I encourage, I'll put the link down below. And it, I, I think it's very appropriate for this description, for the description of dungeon making. When I was a king and a mason, a master proven and skilled, I cleared me ground for a palace such as a king would build, should build. I decreed and dug down to my levels Presently under the silt came the wreck of a palace such as a king had built. There was no worth in it the fashion, there was no wit in the plan. Hither and thither aimless the ruined footings ran. Masonry brute mishandled, but carven on every stone. After me cometh a builder, tell him I too have known. Swift to use in my trenches, where my well-planned groundworks grew, I tumbled his quillions and ashlars and grew and reset them anew. Lime I milled of his marble, burned it, slacked it, and spread, taking the leavings as pleasure, the gifts of the humble dead. Yet I despised, no, uh, yet I despised nor, not nor, ah, try it again. Yet I despised not nor glorified, yet as we wrenched them apart, I realized in the raised foundation the heart of that builder's heart. As he had risen and pleaded, so I did understand the form of the dream he had followed 
in the face of the thing he had planned. When I was king, when I was a king and a mason, in the open noon of my pride, they sent me word from the darkness. They whispered and called me aside. They said, the end is forbidden. They said, thy use is fulfilled. Thy palace shall stand as the others, the spoil of a king who shall build. I called my men from the trenches, my quarries, my wharves, and my shears. All had wrought, all I had wrought, I abandoned to the faith of the faithless years. Only I cut on the timber, only I carved on the stone. After me cometh a builder, tell him, I too have known. I'm not even going to get into the philosophy of that, but because there's a lot there. And Kipling is always an interesting poet, and I, I love uh, a lot of his poems. But it's an interesting phrase where he, you find the pal, you find the ruined footings, and you reuse them to build your plan. And that's what I, th I think you should do when you talk about building a dungeon. You, you follow the instruct the ideas that were outlined by Richard G Gilbert back in 1977 and build an organized plan. So that brings up another interesting one that maybe some of you have not seen. This is an interesting called the Dungeon Builder's Guidebook. This was produced in 1998 and it mentions a couple of interesting features. It says... Talk about the ecology. Where do the monsters that live in the dungeon get their food when not munching on adventurers? That's an interesting challenge. Uh, brings up an interesting story if, for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, many years ago, there I have actually remember seeing and actually playing in uh, an adventure for Tunnels and Trolls, an interesting uh, comparison to D Dungeons and Dragons. And Ken St. Autre, I think, was the one who actually created it. It was called Rat on a Stick, where you were actually down in the dungeon as a selling rats on a stick. And bigger and bigger adventures came by and monsters and so on. But you talk about the ecology. You talk about the cohesiveness. How do the monsters interact with each other? This is an interesting challenge. I remember creating a Gamma World. I think this was first edition Gamma World adventure. And one of the things I took an old abandoned office building and I figured there were three creatures in there. You had birds, you had like canaries and parakeets, and you had cats and you had dogs. So I mutated all of them actually. And it was hilarious because you still had the, the, uh, you still had the cats trying to, who were vastly mutated, trying to eat the birds who were a lot more dangerous and things like that. And then you had the dogs trying to kill and eat the cats. And you had an entire ecology based upon just the things that had mutated in the building. So cohesiveness, how do the monsters interact with each other? Are they at war? Are they cooperating? Why is this monster in here when this other one? In one of my other dungeons I had, there were a lot of undead, and then there were creatures that were called tank bread who were actually killing and eating the undead. It was an interesting thing uh, to put together. So reasonableness. Does the proposed dungeon fit the proposed antagonist? That's one of my biggest complaints about the five room dungeon. Because if you put a big boss in, in this, he wants a big place to live. He would, you know, you've got, uh, you know, are you going to put a dragon without a horde? I mean, come on. I mean, you know, everybody who's seen, you know, the, even the remake of Lord of the, the Lord of the Rings with smog, with it, with the huge pile of gold that he has to, you know, sleep in and, 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 he, he, under, if you've read the book, I mean, lifting, picking up one gold piece, he will detect because he knows each one of them. So what happens is if you're building a dungeon, build a dungeon that's appropriate for your proposed antagonist. And anyway, so then there are some applied dungeon con uh, conceptions uh, or concepts. So 
what was and what is the purpose of the structure? Now, this may have changed over time, but what was it originally designed for and what were what was it? What is its purpose now? What purpose is it actually serving now? What were the needs of the builders? Why did the creators build what they built? So I said, let's take a look at a real world dungeon. And oh, to make it, oh, there aren't any real world dungeons. Yeah, there are. There are, I know of two separate sets, and one of them you can actually get uh, some information about, and the other one is still classified. I mean, it's the, you know, the, all the nuclear uh, war plannings that we did during the Cold War, those nuclear, underground nuclear facilities to withstand nukes, they're still around. Actually, this one was, the interesting one is the Maginot Line. For those of you who are unfamiliar with history, the French built the Maginot Line as a defense from the, uh, after World War I, they were worried that Germans would invade, and so they built the Maginot Line as a, a defensive uh, fortification to stop the Germans from invading. And I was able to pull up a little map of one of the pieces of the Maginot Line. This was massive, but this shows you a real dungeon. Let's be honest, it's underground. You have barracks, you have operational areas. Uh, you know, some of the names are in French, which are kind of difficult to look up. <coughs> it has a secondary entrance and a main entrance. And you've got all these tunnels. And this was a map from where they had repurposed part of the Maginot Line, and I put the link down below, to um, support, uh, you know, a, a nucle nuclear war. And they've done that, and th there's some an interesting thing. There's also a Maginot Line History and Guide, and I'll put the link that's a book on Amazon. So this comes to, let's do a real dungeon example. This is one of my dungeons, and we'll go through through this. So let me explain what I created, and I call this Nolam and Dottie. Now, Nolam and Dottie was an interesting adventure, uh, interesting scenario. It was originally a location for a battalion, uh, not quite, maybe just a little a light battalion, of doppelgangers. Now, I actually have some real problems with 5th edition doppelgangers because they change some things on how they breed and so on. But it was a battalion of doppelgangers, and in my world of Tiglath, there was um, the way the last war 50 years ago, how the, the, the one side of the war lost was the king's guard abandoned him on the battlefield. An entire battalion just disappeared and deserted. Well, they weren't a battalion of his guards. They were, they had been replaced one by one with doppelgangers who had a bigger agenda. So I have an entire table of organization or TOE for Nolan and Dottie. And the, the concept was each platoon had a platoon leader. Um, I actually, uh, let's see, I have the org chart. Um, that is there, you had an officer, <coughs> a platoon sergeant, and two squad leaders in each squad of 12. Not exactly the same as today's military, but it, you'd understand that. So that was a, so you created a platoon. The, the Nola Mandati supported six platoons in what you would call as a company. So you had uh, each platoon had a platoon leader's room, uh, so a platoon sergeant's room, two squad leader rooms, and a barracks, and an armory. So you had that, so, and then you have six sets of those, and then there were additional rooms, which are the training room, supply rooms. There was a room for um, each of the uh, uh, officers associated with, with it. You had um, uh, an S1 officer, an S2 officer, that's executive officer, uh, or operations officer, security officer, uh, no, executive officer, S1, uh, security officer, S2, operations officer, S3, and a supply officer, S4. You had also storage rooms, orderly room, office, and a captain's room. 
So I'm bringing, I'll bring up now, you'll, you'll see the organization of the, the lower level. There was actually, I also had an upper level that showed the, and I'll, I'll bring that up, that there's some problems with the map of the upper level, of upper level. But it, you can see that there were six towers. This was an entrance to each platoon managed to keep that spanned a larger fortification. And uh, <coughs> everything they had was underground. So you had an entire plan for how this worked. And then you had the lower levels where the higher officers and various things were there. Um, but this was, I'll just show the upper level. This is the upper level here. And um, as you see, there are the six towers. There's two entrances into what you would call the Barbican. And then um, the, from there, they, were, they had to pass through a portacullis with the, in, into the other parts of the, the keeps. And the, there were the various towers. And then that connected to the lower level, as you see below, which is the, the layout of the dungeon uh, for all the terrain rooms, supply rooms, and so on. So this was this is following the ideas outlined from uh, way back in uh, 1997 with Richard Gilbert. There was a design to this that followed a military. I created the table of organization and equipment for the the troops. I knew what was what each one of them had. Uh, I laid out a dungeon underground for each one of them. And you compare it, it's not really as cleanly organized as, say, the Maginot Line. <clears throat> but then I don't have the, as closer details to some of the, the stuff that was shown there. But, uh, and it's nowhere near the scale of the Maginot Line. But you can see the Maginot Line as an example of a, of a dungeon that was built in the 1940s. So we're talking 70 years ago. So it's, it's relatively modern comparatively. There were other dungeons built later than that, which would have been to support, uh, to, to defend against nuclear weather, uh, nuclear exchanges with the Russians, and both, both on our side and on the Russian side and various other people built them today. The nuclear missile silos the when they decommissioned the Titan twos, they those silos were actually sold and a lot of people have been rebuilt. You can buy them and uh, some people bought them and then they refurbished them into places to live, <coughs> which is an interesting thing. Those create underground dungeons. They're designed to withstand a nuke. But what happens is that those buildings are heavily fortified. The interesting thing that you have about the Maginot Line was that all the tunnels were underground. All the barracks and things like that were underground. There were tunnels, but the entrances were heavily fortified. So one of the problems that I see with the, quote, five-room dungeon and the examples I've seen, whereas you wander in and then you meet the monsters. Well, this is like anybody who knows anything about military history. It'd be like, oh, um, we walked onto Okinawa, which actually the Japanese allowed us to land. They, they had learned some of the lessons, and then they attacked us from behind. So you have the same idea going all the way back to what we call murder holes, various things like that to defend them. And it can be truly devastating a well-defended fortification is very difficult to take. And my example was, oh, I build, I take a ballista. I like ballistas. You take a ballista and you, he says, imagine you have somebody, you, you have a mutation in a bunch of kobolds. So you have one kobold who has got natural charisma with other kobolds and is much more intelligent than normal. So what does he do is he, he starts about creating various things 
and training. Now, what happens is you train the Kobold. He says, we, we uh, zero the, the ballista. We know exactly where it's going to fire its bolt. Because we load it up, we lock it all down, we pull the trigger, we know where it's going to hit. We could, you know, it says in the dungeon, you could actually do this and characters would just walk right into it. You come up and the, down the hallway, there's this circle in the center of the, the, the centers the hallway and there's a big little X in the center of the circle. What will the party do? Okay, well, anyway, it depends upon how brightly lit or whatever. Odds are somebody's going to step into the circle. And what happens is that you have a single kobold, not very bright, but he's up, he's watching from someplace else. When he sees somebody step into the circle, ideally the one wearing the pointy hat, that was what he's told, ideally the one wearing the pointy hat or the one in the armor, you pull the trigger or pull, pull the lanyard on the ballista. And it goes out and will kill whatever is there. Because let's, you know, it depends upon how nasty you make the ballista and anyway. But it, you can, it could actually devastate the party because you could just, often a character really simple and the kobold I, I actually did this in one dungeon it fired it didn't quite kill the character but the resulting lightning bolts and fireballs at the kobold and you go you killed a kobold and that's all you killed was one kobold and what happens is kobolds can do what are called command detonated. For those of you who know anything about IEDs, improvised explosive devices, the most deadly kinds are the ones that are that are called command detonated, where you have a human actually watching to see when somebody walked by or whatever, and then they set it off at the worst when it would do the most damage. And you can do the same thing in dungeons that you're, you build command detonated traps where the traps don't spring because somebody steps on them, somebody pulls a lever or whatever. You have a lever off in the distance and you have one of the creatures just watching and then they pull the lever because to, to kill the party. Now this is a fast way to do a total party kill if you wanna do that. But the entrance should be heavily defended unless they walk in. You do, can do that in a town. People walking into a town shouldn't just be able to walk in with anything unless you, you know, you have the city gates, you have the guards watching to see what people are doing, what people are coming in. Do you look like you'll cause to, uh, uh, a commotion, cause ruckus? So you, can, you should think about that when you enter the dungeon. You should have, they would have guards planted outside so you've got to take out the guards, but then this is a fortification, so it's there. So what happens is that the more interesting way for them to come in is one of the secondary or tertiary entrances. If you've watched Conan, the, the one with Arnold in it, you know, they decide rather than going into the, the front entrance, they understand there's an entrance in the back where they can sneak in. That's more interesting. So you have your dungeons and multiple entrances. I had, uh, most of my dungeons have at least six entrances into them. Uh, I mean, some of them have more because the, you always connect them up in various interesting ways. You can come down through a whole host of interesting ways to get into the dungeon so they can enter and exit um, the dungeon when I did Nolo Mandati, there were you'll see that there were a bunch of staircases going up. Some of them have been collapsed. I did the history about how part of the tower, many of all of the towers were destroyed except one, and it was buried. That's like, and that my idea, idea behind that one is take a look at um, uh, the German flak tower. I think they actually did one on History Channel uh, about uh, cities of the underworld. The German flak tower, which is still in Berlin, was was heavily built, was designed to for, to defend against the uh, Allied attacks, and the Germans went all out in building this, 
and it's like the French demolition experts came in and tried to destroy it and they only cracked some of the walls. They weren't even able to bring it down even with placed explosives because it was built to withstand just about everything the Germans could imagine being thrown at it. And so that's why there's this hill in Berlin was that they basically tried to bury it and I think there's one side that is still open and you can't get into it except a few people have gone in and seen that. That's an example of a fortification that exists today from World War II. Uh, I believe there was a History Channel movie on it, uh, one of the uh, uh, Cities Underworld or whatever. You can look that one up. But it gives you an example of other things that you can steal from today. Steal these plans, get the layout from them. They, you can draw them up, use them as your own maps. If you can get a hold of a good, good copy of a map at the scale that you want and use those. And now you've got realistic dungeons, real quote, realistic because they, they actually exist. And it, rather than this five room dungeon that they were planned and you can take them over and do things like that. So, Hope I gave you something to think about. If you like my video, press the thumbs up button. I'd appreciate that. Or if uh, this interests you, you can always subscribe to my channel. There's a button right above. Uh, I look forward to hearing some comments. Tell me what you think about this and I'll uh, uh, try and reply and uh, we can see if I'll do some more of these. Thank you.